How are we going to start it all? Just so y'all know, this is not Time Magazine. <laughs> this is not Time Magazine, exactly. Oliver Peck. The big Oliver Peck interview, the big, big deal. <laughs> Oliver Peck. Um, Oliver Peck, man, how did it start, dude? How old are you? How old am I now? Yes, currently at this 39. Moment, 39 years old. One more month, I'll turn 40. Oh, over the hill, dude. That's it, you're done. That's why I bought the old man machine. What's the old man machine? The Electroglide. Oh, the yes, oh, this is new motorcycle. That's yeah, I bought the old man motorcycle. The motor five years ago, I would have fucking sworn that I would never own a motorcycle like this. <laughs> and I would have made fun of anybody that had one. And but now, it's sweet. And now it's on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm old. You are old. Not well, not quite old. Not that old. Um, how long have you been tattooing? Well, that is a common question. <laughs> and there's, I generally just pick a random number that's somewhere close to the amount of time and just stick with that number for a few years. So I've been saying 15 years for a while. But the real exact number depends on what you count. And some people count when they apprenticed or some people count when they or apprenticeship was done and they started tattooing. And uh, so it just, I mean, it kind of depends. Like, I started hand poking tats on myself and a few other people when I was, right before I turned 17. So do I count that? Sure, sure. So then I've been tattooing uh, Do you have friends that those tattoos years. still exist on? Yeah. Then you were tattooing. But not really 47. I mean, so that would be 1988. 19, yeah, like somewhere in 19, somewhere around 1988, I was probably, let's say I was like right around, right, just become 17. I'm 40 now, so it's 23, 24 years. And how did you get the bright idea to start hand poking tattoos on you and your friends? Well, um, my birthday is in July, so I was a little younger. Then, because I started school, right. you know, when in the beginning of January, but it's like the year that I was gonna turn five. So you start kindergarten that year or whatever. So my was actually four when I started. So I was like a little younger. So you know what I mean? So right. I was like I actually graduated high school in '89, which most people were 18 or 19 when they graduated, where I was 17, about to be 18. Right. So yeah. anyway. Um, it's like right as I graduated high school, you see people with tats, and then Fort Worth in the 80s, there was no, like, good tattoos. You can, I mean, I don't know if you know much about Fort Worth, but it's kind of a hick town, whatever. It's like a little bit of a city, but it's not Dallas. <laughs> but there was like, there's only people that had tats were bikers and fucking people in jail and whatnot, and I just see tats. And you want, and I wanted tats. And how do you go about getting tats? You know, some older punk rock dude that like tells you how to fucking wrap thread around a needle, and then you just do it. So my first tattoo was a hand poke moon and star on my ankle that took four hours, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like the size of a you still have cent it? piece. Fuck yeah! No cover ups on my body. Let's see it. Right there, boom. Oh, I don't know if four you see hours. That on the camera or not. No. Yeah, I mean that's like a tiny little sewing needle, and it's like as thick as like a fourteen rounds. So, I mean it's like a lot of dots. That's, <laughs> that's a is, lot of poking. Uh, I, I was just like poking away. <laughs> but I wanted tats, and I like did that tat, and was just like so stoked. And like there's other little kids, other kids I knew that like, dude, do a tat on me. So I was just like, fine. Poking away. So I did a handful of hand poke tats. And then uh, another older punk rock dude, the skateboarder that we skated around, like, like, was telling the story about his buddy who made a fucking jailhouse cassette motor tat gun. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm ingenuitive. Fuck, I can make one of those. So I like uh, made made a made a homemade rotary machine. Out of a hairdryer motor. Whoa. And this sucker would run. 
This sucker would run, dude. It would run. Holy but shit. But I, I mean, I was proud of this thing. I mean, Most people use a Walkman motor. You I know. That's way energy. slow, dude. This <laughs> air motor nice. had three speeds, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was... I can describe this machine in depth, and it was amazing. Let's have it in great detail. Okay. For those of you who don't know, we had to get batteries. <laughs> so, right back on. No, 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 that one. So I'm going to try to pick up where it left off and describe this tap machine in great detail. So anyway, <laughs> um, fuck, did I say all this shit about... You just gotta talk. You just gotta talk about the machine because it didn't didn't pick up. So you just gotta describe the machine and then go from there. But did I already say the stuff about I've seen other people make it with a cassette motor? Yeah. Yeah. Three sure. Times. Okay. So anyway, I get this machine. I make it out of a hair dryer motor, and uh, there was too much shit on it. I tried to initially. I tried to use the electronics that came with the hair dryer and have the three speeds and plug it into the wall but straight out of the 110 was way too much and it was just insane and, the, and, the, and it wasn't enough control and it was also too much electronics to try to like harbor in this fucking in this apparatus in your blow so anyway tattoo machine. I, I uh, had a hair dryer motor various pieces of mint metal zip ties, duct tape, a mechanical pencil J needle JB Weld and uh, JB Weld and uh, I had a, the me mechanical pencil had this metal tube that fit the needle just perfect with enough ink flow and it was a pretty good pretty good setup and I uh, experimented with a few different things but what it ended the final product ended up being a masterful work of art and I had uh, <laughs> I figured out that I ran the, the electrical wire off the back of the hairdryer motor. And I ran it to uh, like nine volt battery, like little gator clip things. And I had, I strung up a series of seven. <laughs> and so you could, the real stat was how many batteries you plugged in. Right. So you could plug in one battery and it'd go one speed, plug in two batteries, it'd go a little faster, on up to so many batteries. And anywhere between four and five nine volt batteries was about the speed that I was using it at. And uh, then I took a cassette case, a ca case to a cassette tape that opens, and I propped the bottom side of it open with a popsicle stick and some duct tape so it held the cassette case open just a hair. And then I split the one half of the wire that went from the hairdryer to the 9-volt batteries and put the wires and duct tape them to the edge of the duct tape uh, cassette case so it was like a foot pedal, and you'd step on it, and the two wires would connect. It would complete the circuit, and it would on. And so I had a foot switch. I'll tell you, the most amazing part about this apparatus is that I had previously never seen a real tap machine or a foot pedal. Like, if I would have known that a foot pedal was an item you could buy, I would have got a foot pedal. But I figured that, hey man, this would be easier if I could like stop and start this machine with your foot with something other than the hand, you know, because I it was just on and off. So I made this foot switch switch quite ingeniously. I think it's pretty ingenious to totally. myself. With so anyway, I, made, I had this whole setup and uh, I probably did uh, dozens and dozens of taps with this machine all without taking the needle out of the machine. <laughs> but I did, um, from time to time, like, sharpen the needle with sandpaper. Sterilization. And so, oh man, I was spraying it down with alcohol, for sure. And keeping, and keeping stuff clean. Of course, not wearing gloves. Why would you? But, uh, Man, I did a ton of tats with this thing. And then by the time I was doing this, I started, like, I was out of high school. I started partying. I was doing a lot of LSD. And uh, most people I was tattooing were on LSD. <laughs> if not tripping at the time, 
they were at least in that mindset of being the kind of person that's just on LSD. So you know, you know, no, no kind of wise decisions were being made at all. But and also, like I said at the time, not knowing what good tattoos were or anything, it's like shit was pretty fucking sweet. But I was like had. Started partying in Dallas. I was like, had a, then it got to the point where I was like, going out to clubs and people would see these sweet ass tats, you know, that I had. And like, dude, <laughs> that, I want some tats. That I had. And, I, and I a few other friends. <laughs> like this, I did this this bracelet of fish right here. That's single needle. I don't know if you can see close, but I mean, it is a fucking a serious thick line. That's a many many passes of a single needle right here. It's and uh. So I did a bunch of tats, and then I, somebody I met, like, gave me a tat, like, showed me a tattoo magazine that you could order something out of, and uh, I fucking was told that Joe Kaplan had the finest equipment you could buy. <laughs> so there was a set that you could buy for like maybe like three hundred and fifty bucks. You could buy the set. A fucking tack here. And so me and about, I would say about ten or so friends all pooled our money together to buy this setup. And the deal was is that I would, for their money that they invested, I would give them taps in right. return. So I got this, we ordered it, it came in the mail, and it was party time. <laughs> like we were doing tats, Mo I mean, other pe a couple other people did some tats, but it was mostly me doing tats. And uh, I just fucking was. Anybody wanted a tattoo, you know, whether it was for money or for whatever, you know, I was just doing as much as I could. And uh, I had probably done, I don't know, let's give or take seventy-five. 80 fucking tats, 100 tats, who knows what it was. Um, and at this point, I had never set foot in a tattoo shop. <laughs> and I would only seen this one tat mag that we ordered the shit out of. Right. I had very little exposure to what the capabilities of tattooing were. You know, I was only using black. Right. For a long, I mean, all this time I had never done anything other than black. And once I got this kit, it had the needles it came with were like some five liners, which the line was just really small because it was like a tight five, and then 14 round shaders. And I just used a 14 round shader for everything. Like, what I mean, it was mostly doing like tribal esque black shapes and or whatever kind of imagery, whatever it was, but I was just doing like black lines and coloring in black or whatever. And the, man, I f started doing tats, and the first so many dozen tats were coming out good and healing okay and looking fine. Like, you know, the stuff I still have today, like these lizards and stuff, I mean, they're they're there. I mean, it worked. <laughs> and uh, Magic. I would tattoo myself every day for the first couple of weeks that I had this set up. And shit was going good. And then all of a sudden, like, people's tats started not healing as well and not working as well and, like, did not really know why. But I had, I had these, I think it was like five 14 round shaders. And I was, still had a few that were unused. <laughs> so I was like using these needles and I was like cooking them in the 20, oven. 25, 30 tattoos per I was needle. cooking them in the oven between tats <laughs> and dipping them in boiling water and such and keeping them clean and uh, then somebody said I, you know somebody asked me if I had looped the needles and I said what do you mean? <laughs> And so they're like, explain that you could look at the needle. I was like, I looked at them, man. They look fine. Like, I looked at them close. 
You know what I mean? I like looked at them. I was like, yeah, they look good. But then they're like, you need to look at them with a magnifying glass. So I did. And these 14 round shaders were just... <laughs> just fucked Tiger up. Claws. And I was like, oh man! <laughs> That's the problem. We need to order more needles. So then I ordered more needles. And after that, it was standard practice to look at the needle with the magnifying glass before each tap. And if there was a 14 round needle that had one or two little hooks on it, I would like use sandpaper and straighten them out <laughs> and sharpen them up. Which is not really as hard as it sounds. Like, I mean, you can, if there's a little hook on a needle, you just get a piece of sandpaper and just, and it'll just straighten out. They're, you know what I mean? I don't know if you've ever done this. <laughs> no, uh, but, uh, I've never done it. It does work. Yeah. It does work. By itself. Yeah. I mean, it is a little more tedious with the 14 round, but with single, <laughs> you can... I mean, Jack Rudy's had single needles he's used for a long time, and he sharpens them and sterilizes them. Probably a lot better sterilization than I was using at the time. Boiling water. Boiling. What can survive <laughs> boiling water? <laughs> Bacon in the oven. Hey, what can survive boiling water? Uh, I, don't I don't know. Degrees for forty-five minutes. I don't know. I don't know anything that can survive boiling water, dude. Not a chicken. So anyway, uh, then I started using getting more needles and looping them and checking them out, and so things got back on track, and I was back on the road to getting better at tattooing. And I did this, and then I, you know, eventually started doing some color, blah blah blah, you know, and then one day. Did, did color come with the kit or? Oh yeah. Okay. I just didn't use it because it was just like, why do you want color? I never seen tattoos with color. Right. Like black was cool. <laughs> I didn't want color tats. <laughs> and at this time, also my plan was to only get lizards. <laughs> this is due to the LSD. And only get them on one half of my body. Luckily, yes. things changed before I got too far along this program. <laughs> And then, but I did throw a Celtic armband in there. Right. But Changed it up a little bit. Got a lot of Jesus tats. Yeah. Back then, when I was on LSD, <laughs> and lots of LSD, me and Jesus were tight. <laughs> we were tight. Um, and uh, oddly enough, is me getting sober was my first step in my disbelief in there being a God. Because when I was on drugs, I believed in God, for sure. And me and Jesus were tight. Tight. So, but anyway, that's a whole different story. But anyway, back on track. We are, uh, I started tattooing, I've been tattooing a bunch of people. And then, just all bullshit. Then I went to jail. Which for LSD. You? For LSD. And I was in jail for like seven months. It sucked. And unlike most people that go to jail, <laughs> I, I decided that I didn't want to go to jail anymore. So I was going to like not do things that Let they arrest you for. Sure. <laughs> so I quit doing drugs and quit selling drugs and quit, you know, stealing shit and whatnot, and I uh, decided I was going to pursue, like, tattooing for money. Honest work. As a job. And so then I, like, had a, I set up a tat shop in my friend's basement and was just doing some, and was doing tats. I had a regular job. What was your regular job? At a conveyor belt manufacturing facility. And what did you do there? Um, we made conveyor belts. <laughs> there was only about five employees of this whole operation. And it was pretty intense. Like, we made conveyor belts of any size. Like, from little shit like at the airport, x-ray, to conveyor belts that from car manufacturers. Like some belts would be 10 feet wide, 3 inches thick, steel belted, 
you know, in a hundred feet distance was an intense belt to make. Right. Like, but they had a machine that would cut, the, like the belts were in rolls and some of the rolls weighed 40,000 pounds and there was like a ceiling crane and you would go up, climb up the rolls, attach a roll to the hooks, lift it up, drop it down, unroll it out on a machine, feed out so many feet and then loop it around and then hinge it together on the end and then roll it up, put it on a truck and the truck would take it, whatever. You know, you see a truck driving down the road with a big ass spool and it's the only thing on that truck, and you're like, what is that? It might be a conveyor belt. <laughs> and it might be the only thing on that truck, because it's so heavy, the truck can't carry anything else. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like heavy-ass belts. So I did that, and I was tattooing at night and hanging out, and then one of my friends that I tattooed went to get a piercing, and the shop he went into to get piercing saw a of tattoos that he had. And they're like, oh man, who did your tats? He's like, oh, my buddy Oliver tattooed out of his house. I'm like, well, we're opening the tattoo shop, and we need a tattoo artist. And they're like, you should tell them to come in. So I went in, and they hired me. And that was the first tatter that they hired this tat shop. <laughs> and me, who had never worked at a shop or done anything, was now a tattoo artist at a shop, not new. Never been even been in one before. I had walked into one shop. By this time, I had walked into a shop in Denton. And literally, me and my friends walked in, and my, the tattoos that I had done on myself and my friends were better than what they were doing. Wait. Like this fucked up shop. In when you were tattooing at your house, were you making stencils or just drawing everything on? I was making stencils um, with pencil on tracing paper and then getting the skin wet and applying the pencil. So very similar to an acetate with charcoal. But it was very light and very hard to keep on the skin. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of designs <laughs> were all had a lot of freehand action going on in them because uh, the stencil would be gone. But a lot of times I would do a few lines and then reapply and then some stuff I would like, once I put the stencil on with the pencil, then I would go back with like a Sharpie and draw it on on top of that. And then it would stay better. But, um, so I get this job, this tattoo shop. I worked there for a few months doing terrible tats. Shops in the gay neighborhood. It was crazy working there. Like the most insane request of tattoo criteria you can imagine. Um, but I was, it was awesome. Like it was great. How long did you work there? I worked there probably six months in total. A few months after I started working there, Richard Stell moved to Dallas from Houston and opened up Paradise Tattoo. So when he did this, like, I heard about it, and it was like, there was other shops in Dallas, but nothing that was like, there's a few other shops, but they sucked. You know what I mean? What year was this? This was 93, yeah. 90, probably somewhere in the vicinity of 93. I would say maybe late 92, okay. early 93. And then... My memory is real foggy about that whole period of my life, whatever. But it's that general, that year frame. But uh, so when Richard Stell opened, I went down there and just went in the shop and met the dudes that were working there, which was Mike King. Mike King. And Joel Ilch. I don't even know that is. Joel Ilch, now uh, he ended up moving up to Richmond and had a shop in, on the border. He's doing great. Um, they were really nice. We kind of made friends. I started hanging out there. Hung out there for quite a while before I ever like got to really know Richard or whatever. But I um, was hanging out there a lot. And then it just, after about a, maybe a month or so ago, hanging out with him, like me and Mike King got to be really good friends. Like going bowling late night and shit. But my shop closed, the shop I worked at closed at like 8 or 9 and they were open till 
you know, after 10 or 11 or sometimes 12. So as soon as I get off work in my shop, I went straight to Paradise and just hung out there. Every minute I wasn't at work, I was at Paradise hanging out, watching them tattoo, blah, 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 and like, got started to get to know Richard, and they were like, they would let me ask questions and whatnot. And then one night on the weekend, I was there, just hanging out. It was just Joel and Mike tattooing. It was probably two in the morning, and there was like people, a line of people waiting to get tattooed. And uh, Joel called Richard, who wasn't at work at the time, and said, "Hey man, we're here. We're busy. There's people waiting to get tattooed. Oliver's here." Would you, would you want to let Oliver do a couple of little tats? And Richard was just like, fine, don't let him do anything with color. Just let him do anything, just little like kanjis or outlines or whatever. And they're like, yeah, there's some girls that want kanjis, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, so I did these couple of kanjis. And then uh, it was totally awesome. Right. You know. First tattoo in a real tattoo working shop. Working in paradise, you know. Did a couple tats, whatever. And then the same situation arose again, and I did, some, you know, like whatever, however much time it passed, another week or something, same situation arose again. And I did a couple little taps, and then apparently, like, Richard asked them how it was, and I did them, they said, oh, it was okay, you know, he's, who knows what they said. They, must have, they put a good word in for me or whatever. So what, a couple days later, I'm at work. And Richard calls, they're like, phone call, they're like, Oliver, phone for you, I take up the phone, and they're like, and it's like, Richard's like, it's Richard still. And I was like, yeah. He's like, you want to learn a tattoo? And I said, yes. And he goes, you going to come work here, I'll teach you how to tattoo. And I said, when do you want me there? He's like, tomorrow. I said, no problem. <laughs> Hung up the phone, told the people I work for, hey man, thanks for everything, I really appreciate it. But I got a chance to go learn how to tattoo, I'm going to go. And they were like, oh, well, yeah, well, that's a good opportunity. We're happy for you. When are you leaving? I'm like, tonight. Packing up. So I packed up, went to work Paradise, ended up working there for probably five years. And so, Richard, did he kind of start you again at the beginning? Or? That was the thing. He was like, you come here. You, you need to forget everything you don't know because you don't know shit and start over. And I just didn't like formally start an apprenticeship from, per se, but I, I was tattooing with limitations. Like, you can only do this right now. You know what I mean? Right. And, and so on and so forth. You know, but within, within a few months, I was tattooing, like, full time doing tats. I mean, I'd already, technically already been tattooing people for probably a year. So the, as far as like dealing with people and dealing with the being a tattooer part and dealing with the aspect of, you know, just hands on and, you know, dealing with blood and fucking being personable, I had that shit down. You know, that's part of the job in itself. Right. But the actual just technically doing things right and having my machines run good and knowing what needles to use and how much this and how much pressure and how long to stay in the skin and how much ink to keep in your tube and all that kind of shit was... I, I think, I feel like I picked up pretty quick for the for the situation I was in. You know, nowadays it seems people learn so much faster. So much information is readily available. Yeah. So much... People now are getting real taps before they learn to tap so they at least People, you know what I mean? People that get tattoos now have way more knowledge of what's going on with the tattoo than I did when I was tattooing for a year. Oh, for sure. Because I forgot no clue. Totally. When, when you're at Paradise, you're getting tattooed by Richard a bunch? I got tattooed by Richard um, a fair amount. And then you got tattooed by the person that taught Richard too, right? I did. I did. After, uh, after a couple of years of working for Richard, I went down to Houston and got tattooed by the guy that he started that working for Fidel Castile, and that was an amazing experience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he is an awesome old Mexican biker dude. Been tattoo, you know, has been tattooing forever, and just you know, not like he. 
I definitely saw, you know, I can see where Richard learns things. You know, you see what, you know what I mean? Like, just, he just sat me down and, like, just grabbed the pen, scribbled on me for a minute and started tatting. And I was just like, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, it's crazy to see that kind of shit when you're a kid. Yeah, what did he do on you? He got a Jesus on my chest. Oh, he's that suited the chest? Yeah. Nice. Richard did one side of my chest. What's the side that Richard did? It's like a girl. It's like a. It's off Ed Hardy Flash. It's like a girl with snake and profile of a girl with the snake twining around her. Oh right, 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 right. And then through Richard, you guys, you guys, you met Trevino and. At the time when I first started working for Richard, um, he was tight with Dave Lum. Him and Chris Trevino, and Sean Deegan. And Jody Griffin were all like best friends. They had all worked together at one point or the other. They had all gotten tattooed by each other. They were all about the same age, as other than Dave Lum. They had sure. all like been tattooed around the same amount of time. And uh, they were all fu all fucking great dudes. And so as soon as I met, as soon as I got in with Richard, I met all them, got tattooed by all them. Like all my first tattoos are from that are all my first real tattoos, other than my, for myself, are from Richard and Chris and Sean, and eventually got tattooed by Dave, got tattoos by Jody, and uh, so I got pretty lucky right off the bat, you know, as far as Texas goes, those were the best dudes, right? You know, and uh, and they all were like, I wasn't. It was kind of like never. Even though I didn't go through like a formal, like straight up, like apprenticeship, apprenticeship, it was like Richard took me under his wing and everybody knew it. You know what I mean? Like, and they all helped me out just as much. You know, like they were all like, oh, you're Richard's kid. Here's, you know what I mean? Like, right. The, the, the respect came from It was like a family thing. thing, man. I mean, like, they would, when Chris would come and work at the shop, you know, I was like, we were we were tight. He could I could watch him tattoo and get tattooed by him and ask him questions. He would tell me shit. You know what I mean? That's cool. It was, it was back in a time when you would go and get tattooed to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, just for sure. Fucking emailing somebody and asking them how they do it. Right, Facebook and somebody. <laughs> like, hey man, how'd you do that thing? But I mean, that was great. I mean, it was a great time, and the the, the five years I worked for Richard were amazing. And uh. And where'd you go after that? Well, keep the negative shit aside. Long story short, you know, all good things come to an end. We split ways. And I went to uh, Houston to work at Scream and Demon Tattoo, Jody Griffin's shop. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was getting in the process of getting tattooed a bunch, heavily getting tattooed, so I was getting tattooed by Chris a lot, and uh, went to work at Houston at the busiest shop, that's one of the busiest shops probably he's ever been, and uh, was planning on moving to Houston and just doing that, but Houston just sucked so bad, I couldn't, I couldn't live there, so I like maintained a house in Dallas and was working at Houston anywhere between three, four, five days a week or whatever, and then coming back to Dallas. And uh, it just got so busy and got so so financially lucrative. I was only, I, for about a few months, I was only working three days a week in Houston, and the other four days a week I was just spending all my money building cars and shit in Dallas and skateboarding. Yeah. And, right. I mean, I was like, and it was awesome. And then the opportunity arose to um, take over a tattoo shop in Dallas, which at the time was called Cyber Graphics. Wow. And the guy who owned it was on a lot of drugs. And the shop was like, the rent was late, the electricity was late, the bill, you know, it was about to go out of business. And my buddy Dean Williams was working there. And two other buddies that used to work for Richard also were working there. And they were, and I heard a whole story, and they were wondering what they were going to do, was because the shop was going to close, and blah, 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 blah. And so I came in, and was like, we all talked, and I was like, we need to approach Kyle, 
and be like, what do we have? What 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 do we have to do to keep this place open or whatever? And it turns out we decided to all go in partners, and I borrowed ten thousand dollars, and we paid off the shop, bought the basically paid off the debt that the shop was in, and did some remodeling, and changed the name and opened it up as Elm Street Tattoo. And that was 1996, 97. And, and, uh, you maybe want to talk about, like, Deep Ellum in general, because, you know, there's a lot, I'm sure a lot of people don't know about, like, the heyday of tattooing, like, in Dallas. The like, time... The time, the last year that I was working for Richard in, in Deep Ellum, in Dallas, um, the shop initially was in downtown, but after about a year of me working there, we moved into Deep Ellum. And uh, there was a handful of, there was like four other shops in Deep Ellum. And it's within, a small, within how small It's a area. small area. It's two streets wide and three blocks long. And <laughs> there was five tattoo shops Jesus. at one time. And... Uh, it was busy. There was like probably 20 bars, 10 or so restaurants, 20 clothing stores, and that's it in this neighborhood. I mean, it was booming. Saturday, Friday, Saturday night, it was like the sidewalks were like a line at Disneyland. Up and down all the sidewalks on all the streets. And it was just, we worked. I mean, it was very common to tattoo until 5 or 6 a.m. Non-stop. Four of us in a shop, as busy as we could be, from noon till 5 a.m. Damn. And uh, did that for years. And so when we opened up Elm Street Tattoo, it was the same. Like the heyday, that whole 10-year period was booming. So we opened up, we were instantly just busy. And uh, most of us had been in the neighborhood for years already. So I mean, it was like, I'd been hanging out in the neighborhood since I was a kid, that's where the clubs were that I was doing LSD in. And uh, it was just, it was just crazy. Like we had, a, we had piercing, and the piercing was making so much money, it was ridiculous. You know, the shop rent was getting paid just off the piercing jewelry that was getting sold. There was five of us that worked at the shop, we were all five partners, so we all five just split up the rent, like we all five paid $250 a week to the shop and kept all the rest of the money we made. So we were fucking partying, working a lot, super busy. Building cars. Building cars, building motorcycles, getting young girls wasted. <laughs> and, uh... Pool parties. Man, it was just, I mean, I don't know what, I mean... And, and then, how, how did you meet? How did you meet Eric Mosky and in all that? Well, that is a big turning point in my life, because I was mostly doing, like we, I had like the few of the Sailor Jerry sketchbooks and a few other traditional Flash references, and uh, I was mostly just, you know, other than I mean, we had JD Crow Flash all over the walls in Richard's shop. But we also had Dave Lum Flash. We also had Ed Hardy Flash. We also had, you know, whatever. So, I mean, people, whatever we're... I was mostly doing the Pinky Young Panther right. more than anything. I was doing that ten times a week. Hundred dollar Panther. Right. You know? And Richard could do it in eight minutes. <laughs> you know? And, like, I got to the point where I was doing it in fifteen minutes. You know? And, uh... The darker the skin of the person that was getting it, the, the quicker that you did it. Sure. And a lot of our clientele was of the darker skin. Sure. We were in downtown, you know. So, I mean, you're doing... I was taught to do tattoos fast. Richard tattoos fast. I was taught to be fast. Richard's like, don't fuck around, you know. Right. And we were doing tattoos relatively inexpensively, you know, compared to what was going on in New York and what was going on in California, you know, like right. real, you know, tattoos were a lot cheaper. 
But, um, but so I was, whenever I got a choice of what tattoo I was going to do, it was mostly traditional tattoo. Like, mostly, you know, based off what I've seen from Ed Hardy, the big red Ed Hardy book and stuff like, and stuff like that. Right. And, uh, and I was kind of the only, and Richard did a lot of traditional tattoos and basically traditionally based tattoos. He'd come from working at Shaw's where all the flash on the wall was Bob Shaw's and and Rob Shaw's and you know what I mean? So I mean it was like, but he was doing wacky stuff and crazy stuff, but it was based in traditional designs. Um, nobody else in Dallas was really doing there's a lot of people doing like early graffiti type stuff. A lot of people doing weird, you know, no, no black tattoos. Which people now think that oh, doing a tattoo with no black is something new. No, <laughs> they were doing it back then. Nope. It was a bad idea back then. Still a bad idea now. <laughs> people think they're trying something new. You're not trying something new. It's just new to you. <laughs> The only reason the people that it was new to back then aren't still doing it is because they figured it out that it didn't work, so they quit doing it. So now there's a whole other generation that needs to figure it out again. So, um, they did it in the 70s too. It's true. Randy Adams did it in the 70s. Didn't work. So in the 80s, started using black again. So anyway, all you kids. <laughs> sooner you learn it the better um, but then he brought up a point big turning point in my life Eric Mosky was on a road trip across the country called the shop said hey I'm on a road trip across the country you know I'd like to come check out the shop of course Richard's like fuck yeah come in we got some people who want to get tats so he comes we get tatted by him Instantly, I'm just like, this guy's fucking the shit. He's the coolest. He's the coolest fucking guy ever. What car was he driving cross country in? Um, they were just in a rental, like, minivan. Who was with him? It was a guy named Shane Truman. Uh huh. A kid. Yeah, a kid. His name was The Kid. The Kid. So. I thought it was Cowboy, maybe. Now. First pre cowboy. Donnie was came through one time. The kid came through one time, and then from then on out it was chummy. But the first time he came through, he came to the shop and he's the coolest motherfucker. And he's doing the coolest fucking tattoos that are just bold, bright, simple, and just flawless. Just nothing fancy about them. They just look perfect. And uh I'm like, this is this is the fucking angle. This guy's, you know, I had never been to California. I didn't know that this was kind of like, you know, commonplace. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people <laughs> in Orange County doing said such tats. Right. You know. Sure. So I'm just like, dude, this guy's the coolest. He's my new fucking hero. Like, getting tattooed by him. Started trying to fucking tattoo like him. And uh, we instantly become buddies. He invites me to come, he comes to Dallas again the next year, invites me to go to California, I go to California, and then the next year after that, I, I have Elm Street's open, so he's going to come back through town again. He comes to work at Elm Street, tattoos everybody there, we all, you know what I mean, I, then I start, I'm on a regular going to California a couple times a year. Start your traveling. A couple times a year I'm going to California, and uh... Working at Classic Tattoo, which was the coolest shop I've ever been in. You know, just coolest shit was going on. Like, I'm used to being in Dallas, where a walk-in is a fucking two dolphins going around the belly button. Right. You know, there, fucking so sunflower with a ladybug on it on the fucking fat lady's ankle. Right. You know, all the fucking standard Texas fucking walk-ins. I go out there, motherfuckers walk in and be like, I want an eagle on my chest. Right. And they're like, sweet. <laughs> This is the shit that I'm giving away for free in Dallas if right. people will get it. And motherfuckers are paying big money. Right. You know, people are like, this is like, you might get some tribal walk-ins at Classic. You might get some, but even the shitty walk-ins at Classic are cool because they're from Rollo Flash or they're from Pinky Unflash or, you know what I'm saying? There's like, right. yeah, no, no. 
remember that shelf was amazing. It's all the same dumb shit, but it's just better. Like, in Dallas, we had the fucking J.D. Crow version. In Orange County, they had the fucking Leo Zuletta version. Right. You know what I mean? Or whatever it may have been. They had the good stuff. You know, like, right. shit was good. So I started going out, tattooing, and I really, like, learned, like, my second phase of tattooing from Aaron. You know, just, like, I learned a lot. Working for him was awesome. And then the years to follow, I was there was a point where I was working at Classic like at every month or every two months, you know, just as much as I could go out right. in the in a, and and that's how you kind of ended up with a lot more clientele in California. Yeah, yeah. I start. I mean, I was and I met every, and that's where I met everybody. I mean, that's how I met Scott. That's how I met you and Nick. What was the first time we met? Do you know the first time we met? Um. I know we were in Japan together. Me and Eric drove to San Francisco and we just went and went to temp went to um two two two. went to two two two. Right. Um I'd known I'd met Juan Puente before two two two. Because he's because he worked at Classic. Yeah. But the first time I met Juan, we went to San. Me and Eric made a trip to San Diego, and hung at, and met Dave Gibson, right. and met Juan. And then I came to San Francisco and got tattooed by Juan. I can't remember if that was the first time I met you or not. Was that when you got the rosy cheeks? I got the rosy. I think we might have met before that. Yeah, I think we met before that. Because I think we came to two 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 and just came. No, to I knew you before busy. that because I remember I was just laughing that you were yeah. getting an ass crack tattoo. But um. But uh, basically, everybody I met in California, like Freddie, you, Jeff, everybody, Dave Gibson, everybody I met through Eric, and I, and Bob Roberts, and man, let me tell you, like walking into the door of a place and being introduced to someone by Eric Mosky, like that carried some weight. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I could have walked in a spotlight and met Bob. And it wouldn't have meant shit. You know what I mean? Right. But sure. I walked in the spotlight. The first time I ever, first time I went to California, Eric was like, "We're going to L.A. We're going to Spotlight Tattoo." That was like day two ever being set foot in California. He's like, "We're going to Spotlight. You're meeting Bob Roberts." And I was just like, "Fucking a." You know what I mean? So I walked in the door, and Eric's like, "This, you know, introduced me to Bob." And not that Bob remembered me the next fucking month or whatever but I'm just saying it was it was more than just like walking in off the street right. and like Bob walked in it was Bob's day off and Eric was like hey Bob you ought to put a tattoo on my buddy Oliver in Bob typical fashion is just like ah fuck well pick something out quick and I'm just <laughs> standing there in the front like caught off guard and I just like look at the wall and be like I'll take that <laughs> and then the first thing I see is just a heart with three daggers. I was like, I'll get it. And he's like, sit down. And dude, f fucking 12 minutes later, I'm, my tap's done. You know what I mean? Like, pretty quick. Like, it's just like, boom, 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 acetate stencil. <laughs> fucking tatted. And it was cool as fuck. And the only thing I regret is not getting more tattoos from Bob. But, uh, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. And, uh, just that, being that's not my first experience with Bob. <laughs> but, I mean, little things. You look back on, on a situation of how things go down, and it could have gone a, a million ways. Right. You know what I mean? And it just went awesome. Like, I'm, A, meeting him with Eric, obviously, uh, in my benefit. B, we walk in, David Allen Coe's on the fucking radio. Right. I'm fucking like, I sing along a little bit. And fucking Bob's like, you know this? I'm like, Psh. grew up on it. David <laughs> Allen Coe, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Instantly, he loves me. You know what I mean? He's like, Psh. this kid's awesome. You know, what I mean? like, instantly I'm, you know, just one little thing to make 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 the situation better. You know what I mean? Could have gone the other way. You right. know what I mean? Right. Who knows? Right. But uh, I mean, there's plenty of instances you meet people in the wrong light and. Then, 
Bless. And the first time I met Mosky, I went to a Classic with my friend Lars. And uh, we just rolled in there, and it was... When Charlie owned it? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's and still it was still turquoise jewelry and shit. Yeah. And, uh, and it was within five minutes, it was like... We were the oldest friends in the world, totally yeah. comfortable. And he's like, "Hey, man, watch tattoo me." I'm like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not working. And next thing I know, I'm fucking tattooing him in his station with his machines and his needles. Yeah. And uh, got to dinner to his house. He's giving me flash. He's like, you know, it was like, no, it was like, like we've been friends forever. Like he had an amazing personality. That dude. Um, Greatest dude. Yeah. Phenomenal. I mean, he, he affected a lot of people. I mean, really, I mean, directly. And uh, um, and so you are now at this point. You're traveling. This is at, now at the time where I've met you, and you're driving around the country in a Cadillac, jumping off the freeway occasionally, and all over the place. You're driving everywhere. Yeah. And you still have this traveling thing. You still as have soon this. As soon as I started traveling, it was over for me. I mean, I can't sit still. Like, I would... Any chance I got. Like, I was lucky to be in a, a situation where I was... Been tattooing a short amount of time, relatively. Right. Five years. Sure. For real. Like, five years legitimately tattooing. Owned my own shop, or as a partner in a shop. But... I wouldn't have, it just the way shit happened, you know what I mean? Like, none of us thought that we were going to own our own shop. It just fell into place, and it's just a situation. Like, something could have gone a different way, and I wouldn't have owned a shop, you know what I mean? But I, I was my own boss, I was eager to learn, I got started traveling, and I realized that, like, everybody is doing it a little different. Right. You know what I mean? Like... And it's noticeable to me. Right. Like, I'm very observative. I pick up on shit. Um, I watch Eric Tattoo, and I like every little thing about it. I can see it. You know what I mean? I'm just like, fuck, man. So then, and then you meet someone else. You meet Juan. And Juan's like... Right. You know? I'll relax. Like, back then, Juan's just... Tatting. You know, like... Eric's like serious and like Juan's just like boop, 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 you know what I mean? Like everybody, every little thing you see is something to learn from. So I mean, like I figure the more I go, the more I, the more people I work with, the more tats I get, the more tats I do, the more different situations I'm in, the better it's going to work out for me. And, it, right. and in the in the long run, it, it's true. Oh, sure. Like the, people, the more you get tattooed, the more you watch people tattoo, the more yeah, you learn man. from them. The, and so I start traveling as much as I can. Anybody that offers me, and this is true to this day, like people are like all the time. This happens to everybody. Oh, hey, make sure you come to my place. You know what I mean? How many times do people say that right. in a daily basis? And I look at them and I'm like, hey. I will be there. <laughs> like, you tell me to come, I will be there. Like, like I went up, met Freddie. Freddie's like, you want to come up here and work? I'm like, yeah. When? He's like, oh, you know, whenever you want to go. I was like, okay. Next week? <laughs> He's like, well, well, well. I'm like, you, whenever. And I'm just like, I'll be, you know what I mean? I'll come out here. And so then, like, sure enough, it wasn't very long. Until somebody was going out of town, and they're like, well, Oliver said, call him, he'll come. And they called me, and I came. You know what I mean? So then I just would go to Eric's, go to Classic, go to, started going to Temple, went to 222 a few times. You know what I mean? Like, once I met y'all guys at 222, Eddie was like, if you want to take a weekend off, you got to get somebody to cover your spot. Right. You know? And so... The first time, I think, it was Jesse wanted to get, take a weekend off, and they were like, and they, and they were like, "Well, oh, you got to get somebody to cover your shift," and he's like, "Well," and then next thing you know, they're like, "Call Oliver." <laughs> I didn't even know Jesse. <laughs> I barely met Jesse, and they like call him like, "Hey, man, uh, I heard that you would 
come out, you would, you know, fill in. And I was like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, on a drop of a dime. Right. Buy a plane ticket, fly to San Francisco, go work the weekend. And everybody's like, why are you doing that? You're spending all this money. You're going to do a couple of tats. It's not worth it. I'm like, man, the first however many conventions I went to, I didn't make money going to convention. It cost me money going to convention. Right. Buy a plane ticket, buy a hotel, get a tattoo, sit there at the booth and do nothing. Right. All weekend. Like, and people, a lot of people do that and they're like, I'm not doing a convention. I didn't make any money. I was like, I didn't, I wasn't there to make money. I was there to learn. Right. Same no, thing, same, same. But going to 222 worked out because I showed up there and Everyone's booked. You're booked. Jeff's booked. Juan's booked. So every walk-in is mine. Right. How easy is that? <laughs> and like, none of y'all want to do the dumbass shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm rare to do anything. I fucking made a ton of money. Right. And, and, I, and you find that working with people is also a learning experience. And so, I mean, back on the traveling thing, I just, I can't sit still. Like, I get home, I work, I love working around the guys I work with, and even now, the best, we got one of the best crews we've ever had. Like, now I'm working with Carl full time, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Like, there's always, we've always had good people to work with, you I have a lot of good guests coming through, so I love being at home. But, gotta go. Can only be home so long. Um, so I, I mean, I, and then at, you know after at, well after Eric passed, so, you know, and then Classic was shut down for a while. Then that that's when you started working at True for Clay. Well, Eric passed away, and at the time for the last couple months of his for the, I don't know how long it was, but I mean there was leading up. To the end, he was not working very much. Sure. I he asked me, he was looking for somebody to manage the shop, and I said, "Dude, I'll do, I'll do it." And he's like, "But you don't live here." I was like, "I can do it. Like I can do it. I'll be here." So I, then I committed to be there two weeks a month, and so I was at Classic two weeks a month for the, for the last few months, and. When I was gone, there was good, solid people there to rely on, and uh, and I just kept track of what was going on when I wasn't there. And we kept it going, and then Eric passed away. It was closed for a very short time, and then it re it reopened, and Eric's family asked me to continue to manage the shop, and so I did. And I would continue to be there two weeks a month for, I don't know how long. Sure, and then Nick, Nick was there. <clears throat> it was a while. Tom Mosier, Nick, Colin and Jim. Colin and Jim. Good, good. And then, and then a guest, you know, a, there was a guest artist. Per, you know, I mean, somebody any, was there anytime, every week. Anytime, anytime, yeah. Right. And I, that that time is some of my fondest memories of tattooing, man. We just that shop being there. It was beautiful weather. Beautiful Moss, shop. Yeah, remodeled it. And Did even the last, the last year that Eric was there was some of the greatest times of tattooing. I mean, it was like, it was like taking a step back in time and like tattooing like, you know, you, where you felt. I mean, you really, working there at the t and the people that were coming and getting tattooed and the kind of tattoos you were doing and the satisfaction you were getting out of the day of work there, it was like being in an older time. It, man, that's cool. Like, walk-ins there were amazing. Eric trained trained the customers yeah. on what to get. The first tattoo, one of the first walk-ins I did was a crawling panther on yeah. a guy's arm. Yeah. And then he ended up coming back, getting sleeved by Nick and I yeah. and everybody else who worked in the shop. Awesome. And so, I did that until all good things come to an end. Had a fun, you know, things... Just got the milk went sour, and I had to step away from it. There was a lot of obviously being there with without Eric's and and watching things change, either 
the way Eric would have wanted to him, the way he wouldn't have wanted to him, whatever the case may have been. Like, just watching things change, I just got to the point where I couldn't be a part of it. And, uh, and there was totally left on a good note, you know, and just, I did, I, I feel like I did serve my term is what I needed to do. And like, right. the shop is still there, the shop is still open. And that was the goal, was to not let it perish, you know what I mean? So right. I was like... <clears throat> and uh, True Tattoo had opened. Um, I had known Clay for a few years by this point. Quite a few years. Um, I had known Chris Garber for a few years. Um, I don't know how long... True wasn't open very long before I started working there. Sure, yeah. Because I had started working there, even when I was still working at Classic, <clears throat> I was working at True a little bit because I, I had an apartment in Hollywood at the time for sure. and then, reasons and then we Nick, don't need to talk about. Yeah, and then Nick, <laughs> well then also Nick was at, by that time Nick was at True. Well, I moved to True and then sure. brought Nick to True and for a short time brought Tom Mosher to True. Um, and then again, it was all over again the best experience of, I mean, I've been blessed with these amazing experiences of working. And the, the first two years that I worked at True Tattoo, couldn't have been better. Clay Decker, Chris Garver, Tim Hendricks, you know, just... The sleeping helper. Man. Dame. 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 <laughs> Hell of a shop helper. <laughs> But, uh, man, it was just, I mean, it was, a, it was an amazing shop. It was in Hollywood. And True Tattoo to me really stood out because in the midst of the worst neighborhood on the planet where there is a hundred, at the time, there was 120 shops in what is called Hollywood, which people think about Hollywood, and they're like, oh, it's Hollywood. Hollywood is small. Like, Hollywood is a neighborhood. Like, Los Angeles, Los Angeles is a city. Hollywood is like five square miles or some shit. Right. So. And there is a fucking 120 tattoo shops? Are you fucking kidding me? How are you going to ever do make a, make a business in it? Right. But True Tattoo, busy. Hollywood Boulevard where a million people a day walk the sidewalks. 37 tattoo shops in, in, in one eye length of the street. But they also sell bongs, t-shirts, and fucking fake statues of the Grammy fucking dude. Whatever they fucking do. But, I mean, like, <laughs> True Tattoo is a real tattoo shop amongst the shit. And uh, a lot of my Orange County clientele made the trip to LA. Sure. And uh, I built more clientele and feeding off, learning learning from all, getting to work next to those people. Again, watching more people tattoo. Watching Chris Carver tattoo. Unfucking real, dude. And, right. And through that is, that, is that when you kind of started tattooing bands and going on tour with bands? Um, the next big stage of my life. <laughs> Uh, I, uh... The next big, big, big I, I mean, I started, like, tattooing. I did tattoo a few band members here and there. Um, but I had a couple of friends that were in bands that went on tour with other bands and blah, blah, blah. And then, so I... Every tattooer is going to tattoo some bands here and there. Sure, For sure. some reason, my closeness to these certain people in the music industry just... And my charismatic personality made people, you know, more, I would say my, my personality did me more good than my actual artistic talent at the time, you sure. know what I mean? Like, which is a part sure. of tattooing. Which yeah, is a, which is know, a very big large part. part of tattooing, and I fucking used everything I could, you know, used, used the connections you make, used the, whatever tools you have, and, you know... I'm not, I mean, 
I don't know how weird. I mean, my personality is one of my biggest assets. I think as far as like just being friendly and like being open to people and giving people. I think I give people what they want, you know, and to an extent, and they they're stoked about it. So that just helped me out. And then a couple of friends of mine went on the Warp Tour. One friend in particular, Aaron Finnan, was working for a band on Warp Tour in 2005. And the guys in this band saw all of Aaron's tattoos, wanted tattoos. Aaron said, come out. I went out on the Warp Tour. I was going to go for a few days. I did a, a tattooed as many people as I could in those few days. And then it was like time to fly home. Like from wherever, from Cleveland or whatever the fuck city we're in. And everybody's like, dude, more people want tats. You can't go home. I was like, dude, I already got a plane ticket. And these people are like, we'll buy you another plane ticket. Stay two more days. Fly home from fucking whatever city. You know, book me another plane ticket. And I'm like, you book me another plane ticket, dude, I'll stay a couple more days, do more tats. So I did. Then it's time to fly home again. Everybody's like, dude, more people want tattoos. Can't go home. I was like, dude, I got a plane ticket. It's my second plane ticket. I already changed plane ticket once. They're like, we'll buy you another plane ticket. So I'm like, next thing you know, I've been on the thing for like two weeks. And I'm like, I got to go home. Like, I got to go home. I got to pay rent. I got to do this. I got to do this. My dog's at the center. You know what I mean? Like, there's... It's, I gotta, I, there's nothing I can do, I gotta go home. Like, well, you gotta come back out. So I was like, alright, I went home, handled my shit for a week, got on a plane, flew back out to another city, met up with the tour, and did another, and this, you know, I'll come out for a week, come out for a week, time to fly home, you can't go home. Dude, I was like, there's like 800 people that work on this tour, including right. bands, sound guys, merch guys, tour managers, bus drivers, catering people, production staff. It's like a lot of people. Right. Like, there's no way you can The tattoo majority them of all. these people which would be wearing and getting tattoos. So, and, you know, I've said it a million times, there's kids, they're in bands, they're on the tour, it's eight weeks long, they play 30 minutes a day, the rest of the day, they sit on the bus, smoke weed, and play video games. <laughs> That's it. You can't leave. You can't go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. Usually you're in a parking lot outside of town, stuck there. You know, you could get a cab and go somewhere, but whatever. You know what I mean? Like, people sit on the bus, smoke weed, play video games. That's it. And, the, and those, Or get tattooed. Those couple of times you were, you were tattooing on the tour bus. Yeah. Which is pretty t tight quarters. Tattooing on the tour bus, back lounge, using whatever you can to set up. You know what I mean? Duct taping lamps to a cabinet, whatever you gotta do. Um, camping. <laughs> yeah, it's man, like it's camping, awesome. Dude. It's awesome. It's like camping. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, this is the ticket. <laughs> On the road, traveling, tons of business, music, cool people, seeing the country, doing it. I was like, They've got to be, I've got to do, figure something out with this whole program. I.e. So I, the fucking, program. talking to my tight bros at the time. <laughs> Coercing <laughs> your friends. I like come home from this tour and I'm like, dude. And I tell a handful of people about it. And my two buddies, Nick Roden and Cody Miller, they like, Man, it sounds awesome. <laughs> sounds totally awesome. And I'm like, we have, like, we go through, I go through and, like, do the math on a ton of different scenarios. Fucking get a tour bus, get a this, get a that, blah, 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 blah. <sighs> Next thing you know, we buy a trailer, a 40 foot fifth wheel trailer, build a tattoo shop inside it. It's got a kitchen. It's got a somewhat usable bathroom. So you can sterilize your needles in the boiling not water. Much, no, 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 not no. much of a usable bathroom. It's got, it's got a bathroom. It's somewhat usable. It's got a kitchen that's completely functional. We deck this thing out, man. It's got a drawing station, light, light table. box table, autoclave, 
ultrasonic, two ta two complete tap stations. And seven like you beds. see you see photos of people getting tat, and it looks like a tat shop. The place is legit. Flash on the wall, check the floor. Is legit. Like you see the outside of this thing, and you're like, what the fuck? You see the inside, you're like. And when I say it looks good, I mean when we first built it. Because <laughs> it soon got trash. But it had fridge, it had beds, it had AC, it had lights, it had stereo system. This thing was bad to the bone. Totally unsafe. <laughs> We're living in the back of this thing, going down the highway, which <laughs> is completely illegal. <laughs> And, uh, and completely unsafe. But I convinced everybody that it was... <laughs> and I think I kind of believed it myself. <laughs> I think that I had come up with the idea that it was legal in some states to ride in the back of a fifth wheel trailer. Which, I'm not sure... If it is or not, <laughs> I don't think it is. I know for a fact. I know for a fact it's illegal in most states. <laughs> there might be some states it is legal in, but I told everybody, whatever. People, we, nobody really asked. No, no, no. But there was a couple instances where we got. We were at a gas station. We pull in to get gas, and we get out, and the cop pulls up like. Y'all can't ride in the back of that thing. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're cool. We're just, uh, we're just kind of, you know. And we'd all pile in the front of the truck and drive off around the corner. And then how about get back in the back and go. But, uh, so this is 2006. We build this, build this thing, call it to Gypsy Queen, go on the road. And uh, we spent however much money building this thing and buying a truck to pull it and Man, I thought it was the greatest thing that ever happened. <laughs> and regardless of what anybody else that was a part of it says, they had the time of their life. We, we did, we did. And I, financially, I made money. You know, it was very expensive to be on the tour. Gas was very expensive. We're driving a, a diesel truck with a 40-foot trailer behind it. Like, we're getting... Paying a driver. We're lucky to get 8, 9, 10 miles in a gallon. We did 30-something thousand miles in seven and a half weeks. We're looking at... We're like 10 plus thousand dollars in this summer. Just gasoline. <laughs> Not to mention paying the driver 500 bucks a week um, and all the other shit you got to do. But uh did a lot of tats and I spent the next, next five years doing the whole tour in one apparatus or another. Either that RV, RV or, or tour, the bus, tour or bus or trailer or whatever. And... Uh, Doing to, I mean, working seven days a week. I was real. I'm the only one out of the group that did it. That did it the whole summer. You know, that did the whole right. eight weeks of the tour. Other oh, the people would come. Queen? Yeah, other people would do a couple of weeks and then come back and do a couple of weeks. Well, we stole Nick. And that's why. I mean, honestly, like for Nick and Cody being in it, like if you would have been there the entire summer. It would have been awesome. You would have made enough money. Sure. But we both had jobs. Y'all had jobs. <laughs> you had a job with another boss. Yeah. I had a job... With no other boss. With no other boss. So I was just... I was in it for the whole summer. And, it, like... I did... Like... Granted, I'm a workaholic. Or whatever you want to call it. Like, I'll work seven days a week. I'll work... 14 hour shifts. Well, so plus being on it that long, like you're on the tour the whole week, so you're, you're, you're Everybody more flexible on doing bigger tattoos yeah. because you had the space yeah. and the healing time. Like I can fucking do a whole sleeve on someone. If somebody, like, towards the last couple years I did it, 
the first day of Warped Tour, people will be like, I want a back piece. I want a sleeve. I want two sleeves. You know what I mean? And they would get tattooed every week for eight weeks. Eight sessions, you can do a sleeve. Sure. You know what I mean? You're like, one week, next week, next week, next week, next week, you know? By the time you're up here, this one's healed, start coloring it. You know, whatever. Like, you have to do that. And uh, a lot of people don't want to work. 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. True. But you can't pay $10,000 or $13,000 in gas doing 3 tasks a day. Right. You know, that's just not... Working 3 days a week. Yeah, man. Doing I mean, yoga the other days. And on days off, when the tour's on a day off, that's your one of your busiest days of tattooing because A, there's no drive time, B, there's no shows, everybody has all day off. You know, all the bus drivers, all the cooks, all the sound guys, they can get tattooed all day long. So, I mean, that's like your busiest days. Right. So, I'd work basically 60, 70 days straight without a single day off and working long hours. Just out of my mind. <laughs> like, if I... <laughs> out of my mind. Like, well, also, you know, you're adding in the factor that... You're I don't in drink. State, you're in southern states where it is... 99 degrees with 98% humidity oh, yeah. and the AC is not working. AC just keeps it barely ter tolerable. It's easier to turn the heater on. Barely tolerable. I mean, in Arizona, it's fucking hot. I mean, you can't even stand outside for an hour. You know what I mean? Like, in the, in the RV, it is fucking like 85 Degrees with the a both ACs cranked, you know what I mean. So you're in there, and 85 indoors is pretty warm. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty gross. It's dude. pretty warm, dude. So you're in there, shirt off, sweat dripping. You know what I mean? You're whatever. But uh, that's the only way. I mean, that's the only way to do it, though. You can't just go out and do a couple taps. No. No way. Not Oliver Peck, anyhow. It's not how Oliver Peck does it. All right, so now you're not on tour with tour buses and whatnot. And now, what are you doing now? Now, for, I, I know that you have got a new adventure going on in LA. Um, I've been working at True for the last six years or whatever it is, pretty regularly. You know, at least. If I'm on a long tour and I don't go in a month, then I don't go one month or so. But I'm usually there almost every month, sometimes for one week, sometimes for more. But uh, And I've been doing that pretty consistently for a while. The end of last year, True Tattoo got to a point where Clay Decker just wanted to not... I mean, the easiest way to say it is he just didn't want to be a boss. You know, we got him... This, got him the shop had just grown to a point to where... You know, he didn't want to deal with it anymore. You know, some people don't want to deal with it. Right. Um. So, the opportunity arose for me to take it over, and I did. And it's pretty. I basically took it over, but nothing else has changed. You know, I just still go there one week a month, and have a shop manager that just takes care of everything and it just hired some hired some people remodeled the shop give it a new give it some positive energy and uh, it's going pretty good but I'm still traveling I'm not doing I don't have a traveling tattoo shop where I travel and tattoo anymore but I just do a lot of um, been going to Europe been going wherever I can. Do you have a way for people to be able to figure out, like if people want to get tattooed by you and say they live in bumfuck Egypt, and they, is there a way for people to, you know, uh, keep track of where you're going to be? Do you Facebook? Do you I, do fa I do Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that, and I am very bad at keeping a predestined schedule. I don't, uh, I don't book any appointments any further out than about two or three weeks. 
Because you never know the fuck you're going to be because, in two or three weeks. Um, yeah, you don't know where you're going to be. I don't want to book somebody for next month and then somebody call me and say, hey, you want to go here? And I'm like, either say, no, I can't go because I have a commitment or call that person and cancel them. It's easier to just not book them until you know where you're going to be. <laughs> Years ago, when I was getting tattooed by Chris Trevino really heavily, he was booked a year in advance, and he has this system to where every three months, on the first day of the quarter, he would book for that quarter, then the next quarter. So on January 1st, he would book for the third, second quarter. You know what I'm saying? Right, yeah. No, that's like, what we do at our shop. He would book these three-month three, three month increments, but whatever, but it would be like a year, like you'd be on a waiting list and it would be a year before your name came up and he would book you out or whatever. And so I kind of adopted this plan on a, it started out on a, on a couple of week basis and then it got up to a month basis to where every month I was booking for, like in January I'd book February, February I'd book March, whenever, and I was booked up a couple of months in advance and it was the worst thing <laughs> that ever happened to me in my life. I uh, had to cancel people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, people book an appointment for a couple months away, and then you're like, oh, you want to go to fucking Hawaii? Or you want to go to fucking here? Or you want to go to there? And you're like, hell yeah, call everyone. <laughs> cancel the week. I'm out of here. You know what I mean? And then like all these people you cancel have been waiting a month or two weeks or, you know, whether they've been waiting two weeks or a month or three months or whatever it is, like you feel bad. So you're going to get them in as soon as you can. And so that means on your day off, you're going to get them in. Right. So that means you never have a day off. You know what I mean? Right. And when I'm at home, I like to have a day off when I'm at home. When I'm on the road, I don't need a day off. I don't know what the fuck there is to do in that town. I'm just here to work. Right. Like, so anyway, but that, I just, it didn't work out for me. Like, I don't want to just be locked down to whatever. I want to be able to have. So I have adopted my new program, and I've been doing it for years now, where I only book two weeks in advance. Like, it's not hard to get a tattoo for me. You call me up, I get you in in the next two weeks. <laughs> it's easy as that. If you don't get in this two weeks, you get in next two weeks. And so it's like, I don't know where I'm going to be. Like, so when, if the, I don't even, sometimes it's even less than two weeks. Like, when I book my plane ticket to be in L.A., I'm going to be there for fucking six days. The day I booked that plane ticket, I booked those six days up. And I'm booked up for while I'm in L.A. or whatever it is. And so, but people, you know, are like, oh man, you're so hard to get a hold of. And I was like, that's just because I can't remember to check email or can't remember to return a phone call or whatever. But right. When I have an assistant, it works out great. When I don't have an assistant, it's chaos. Do you currently have an assistant? It's chaos, right? <laughs> <laughs> Total chaos. Man, now down to serious business. Serious business. This is the most sporadic, cramless bullshit ever. I think the timeline's working out. All right, good. Serious business. Okay. Let's, get, let's get to know all our peck a little bit. Red shoes. <laughs> ducks. Non-tattooing questions. Dice. I have a pretty, pretty good story about... um. Basically, being insane, I guess. I'm comfortable <laughs> with my le with my with my with my knowledge of my own insanity, as it would be. Whether you call it obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever you want to call it, um, I like to consider it that I'm a man of my word. <laughs> I think it's a very good. Character traits. If I say I'm going to do something, then like I will do it. Your own fork. Then I will do it. For instance, red is my favorite color. Everyone has. A, most people have a favorite color. Most people that have 
any kind of personality or character or style prefer one thing over the other? Chocolate or vanilla? Apple or peach? Cobbler? You know what I mean? Like... Apple or peach cobbler? You know what I'm saying? I hear you. Like, I like the color red. Nothing wrong with it. I'm a little obsessive over it. <laughs> At one time, I, and back in the days when I was on a lot of LSD, it was very intense. <laughs> I was known to show up at parties with a red hat, a red shirt, a red jacket, red pants, red belt, red socks and red shoes, with a red bag. I was that guy. And I'm like, damn. You know what I mean? Ooh, that's red. I would wear, you know what I mean? I was like, <clears throat> but anyway, I most of my life, I would pick red if it was a choice. Like, if there's a choice of color, I'll take the red one. You know what I mean? Is that weird? No. It's not weird. So, if most... <laughs> it's not weird. <laughs> I love... So, and so I would... Most of my shoes I wore, most of my adult, or like, when I, or most of my conscious life, from like middle school up, most of my shoes would be red. Through high school... Most of my shoes were red, red Chuck Taylors, red Vision Streetwear, red Vans, whatever the case may be. And uh, I had some shoes that weren't red here time and again, because sometimes you'd want a new pair of shoes if they didn't make red ones or whatever, you know. I had some shoes that weren't red. I've never known that part of you, but sure. I've well, never seen I'm red. talking pre-91. Okay. I was, uh, pre-91. 91 was the pivotal moment well, for no, no, no. shoes. It was. And it was. khaki pants. So... I was primarily wearing red shoes. I had a few pair that weren't red. And we were at a party. Everyone was on LSD. And somebody brought up the fact that I had on red shoes. And that I always had on red shoes. And I was like, man, I'm, I love red shoes. You know, and I went on this like crazy LSD induced speech about how red shoes were the coolest. <laughs> and then I had a declaration that from this day forth <laughs> I would never wear shoes that weren't red again. And have you? And after this declaration, I went upstairs to my room. We were at a party at my house. Uh, the house that me and my fellow LSD cohorts shared. I grabbed the few pair of shoes I had that weren't red, proceeded to take them to the backyard, hosed them down with lighter fluid, and burned them. <laughs> and since, um, the only time that I wore shoes that weren't red was when there was absolutely no choice, as in being in jail. <laughs> And having to wear state issue shoes. What color were they? They were black. They were black. Black, just straight up like military issue black boots. Because I was in a boot camp program. Boot camp. So, and since then, I just wear, I only wear red shoes. Red shoes. And uh, I have. Hundreds. <laughs> I have, not only do I have the shoes that I'm currently wearing and shoes that are in said current rotation, which shoes that are, that I'll wear time to time and that are still wearable, I have those, which is probably a few dozen pair. I also have shoes to be worn in the future. <laughs> future shoes. Which are still in the box. I probably have, let's say, a hundred pair. <laughs> Maybe 80, 90 pair of shoes that have never wow. been worn that are in boxes that I have. Not only do I have those, but I also have all of the previously said out of date shoes. I have seen these shoes. So I have countless, previously worn shoes. countless pair of shoes that are worn to the point that you could just not wear them anymore. And I just have them all. Because I don't throw things away. Right. And, uh. With the garbage bags. What I first. Wait, wait. <laughs> With the garbage bags. But the theory, bags. you gotta hear the theory of the creek shoes.
issues, man. Okay. Right. Okay, growing up, we would play in the creek, right? Uh-huh. Sure. And you have creek shoes. Yeah. Like, you have your old beat-up shoes that would, oh, we're going to go play in the creek. Don't wear your new shoes. So I'd go and put my old shoes on and go play in the creek or whatever. So then, once I got to older and got to the point... <laughs> Where you weren't playing Well, I was creek. like, shoes would wear out. And I'm like, man, these shoes are worn out. And then somebody or a girlfriend or somebody this would be like, I, you know, be like, tr attempt to get rid of these shoes or suggest that I maybe throw these shoes away. I'm like, no, 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 no. I might need those. Why would you need these? I don't know. I want to go in the creek. <laughs> so now I have like 97 pair of creek shoes. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. But now I really just like um, anything that I hold that I've had within close proximity of my person for any length of time, I grow some weird attachment to and don't want to like betray it by throwing it away. <laughs> now earlier on I said, is that weird? And you said no. Now you can say yes. 